Ladies and gentlemen, the hour of 9.45 having arrived two and a half minutes ago, I'd like to call the uh, Tuesday, April 14th, 2015 County Board meeting to order. Would the County Clerk please call the roll? Ellen. Present. Auger. Here. Barrio. Here. Castro. Here. Davis. Here. Ford. Here. Fraz. Here. Gillum. Here. Heyman. Here. Polche. Here. Ismail. Present. Kenyon. Here. Cesar. Here. Leonard. Here. Lewis. Here. Martin. Here. Molina. Pollock. Here. Grant. <clears throat> Sheffro. Here. Silva. Here. Smith. Here. Sir. Vasquez. That's right. Here. Winicki. Here. Quorum, Mr. Chairman. Good. We have a quorum. It's good to hear that, Vasquez. Oh, thank it's you. It's good to hear that. So everybody's looking good this morning. Uh, in recognition of uh, National Public Safety Telecommunicator Week, uh, I'd like to ask Bill Lindner, uh, King County Day Shift Team Leader, to come to the microphone to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. So, Bill. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. If you'd remain standing, please. I'm going to ask Barb Garza to step forward and lead us in prayer. Our dear, kind, gracious Heavenly Father, we're very thankful for the many blessings which thou provides to us, for our nation, for our freedoms, for our homes, and for our families. We ask you to bless us this day in our various roles as leaders, legislators, public servants, and citizens, that we might work together to strengthen our community, not only for ourselves, but for future generations. Heavenly Father, we ask you to bless those men and women who serve in the military, that they might be in thy loving care as they strive to defend the things which we hold dear. Heavenly Father, we acknowledge thy hand in all things and ask that thy spirit might attend us this day. In the name of thy beloved Son, Jesus Christ, amen. 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 <clears throat> Thank you very much, Barb. Okay, may I have a motion and a second to approve the minutes from the March 10th, 2015 meeting? So moved by Mr. Ford, second by Mr. Kenyon. Uh, are there any thoughts, comments, <laughs> changes? If not, all those uh, in favor of approving the minutes say aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. Uh, the ayes have it. And the minutes are approved. Um, okay, uh, into the agenda, uh, new and unfinished business, uh, first presentation discussions. Uh, I'd like Don Bryant to come forward to the microphone. Do we have Don? Okay, good, good. Uh, we're going to try to do this very briefly. Um, I'd like to acknowledge our gratitude that the tornadoes that occurred last week uh, didn't hit us last Thursday night. Uh, Ten more miles, and it would have been, uh, you know, the good people of Hampshire. Uh, I think uh, Don has, uh, I believe, is it four slides, Don, that you're going to share? Five slides you're going to share with us. We're going to try to go through this uh, very quickly. You know, we want to be good neighbors, so the natural human response uh, is maybe twofold. Number one, how can we help those who uh, were affected, uh, both volunteering and uh, donations? Uh, but the, the second question, and, and the one that's really up to the board here, is what if Fairdale and Kirkland had happened here? What is it that we can learn from that experience? Uh, from from what we're doing in helping others, uh, how can we also then help the half a million people who we serve? Um, Don Bryant, who's in charge of emergency management, and then Ken Anderson, in charge of our environmental department, uh, I asked them to share their thoughts on what if it had happened here? I believe that uh, Don's going to share a map He's going to briefly discuss recent reorganization of emergency management, the rapid response team, which is uh, the core of his 65 volunteers, and then a disaster relief bureau, 
uh, which divides into both short-term and long-term relief for people who are affected by natural disasters. Uh, the challenge uh, that folks have in trying to help even, um, uh, you know, uh, Fairdale or Kirkland is you can't just hop in the car, show up, and, and think that it's, it, it doesn't become an even greater burden. And just as we need to learn, well, how can we be the most effective and productive, um, uh, Don has some uh, thoughts on that. So uh, there are some volunteer organizations for assisting in disasters. It's probably the main point that I'm going to ask uh, Don to uh, cover. But it's, uh, we help each other, but we also get prepared to help ourselves. Um, and it's not a matter of if it's going to happen, you know that it's, it, 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 it's just a matter of when will it happen and will we be prepared. So with that, I'm, uh, that's the preamble, the framing. Uh, on to you, Don. Okay, thank you, Chairman. The, uh, the map you see on display the red line indicates the path of the tornado that occurred last Thursday. The questions I've been asked in the last couple days is what would have happened if that path would have moved a little bit further east. It would have, would have taken it directly through Kane County. <clears throat> so when we, when we look at that and ponder how the county would respond to this type of incident, um, you know, you would first have your, your typical police and fire response uh, to the incident augmented by a very robust mutual aid system, statewide mutual aid system, that would give police and fire the resources they need to conclude the public safety aspect of the response uh, fairly quickly. Um, along with the, with the public safety response, the rapid uh, response team from our agency would go to the scene and assist with whatever is necessary, whether it be lighting up the scene, uh, as we did in Fairdale the night of the incident, to traffic control, to, to start helping people um, recover from the, from the disaster. Once we've moved away from the initial response and moved in recovery, there are a number of things that, that take place. Uh, we just recently reorganized our agency to include what we're calling the Disaster Assistance Bureau. And their main responsibilities are going to be shelter operations, donation management, and resource management following a disaster. Um, we've all heard on the media about all the donations that have been taking place uh, up, in the, up in the Fairdale Kirkland area, somebody has to oversee that, somebody has to manage that. And this is a group that would be part of that management team. Uh, also in the in past several years, we've seen a change take place from um, putting out the, the outcome help call to actually using a uh, new organization called Volunteer Organizations Active in Disasters, or VOAD. What VOAD is, it's a uh, collection of disaster specialists that will come in and help the community recover from the disaster. Uh, you can see a short list of the agencies that are part of the COAD coalition. Uh, you, see, you see familiar names like the American Red Cross, United Way Salvation Army, Catholic Charities, Lutheran Family Ministries. Uh, but one, one name particular there is Team Rubicon. Team Rubicon is a group of Army veterans who have gotten together and travel all over the country to work disaster recovery uh, on a volunteer basis. Um, very, very robust group, very um, qualified group to come into a community and actually help recover, that community recover from the disaster. Um, it's important to build internally within the county volunteer capabilities because quite frankly government can't do it all, especially in a disaster situation. And this is what we're seeing both in Rochelle and, and Fairdale is that they're relying very heavily on volunteer help. Uh, so like I said, we're really kind of moving into the use of the VOADs. Uh, to help us, the, the key thing here is they are vetted before they're deployed, so we know who we're getting, we know what the qualifications are, versus spontaneous volunteers where we don't know a lot about them. 
Um, you know, the, the, the trend is using the VOADs on the disaster site. What we're hearing out of, out of, out of uh, Fairdale this morning is over the past several days, they have received a large amount of donated items. Um, you know, whether it be food, clothes, bedding, that kind of thing, to the point where they're overloaded. That they have more than they can use right now. What the incident commander up there is asking for is monetary donations. You know, you can imagine that these families up there who have their homes totally devastated only have what they're wearing on their backs. So they're literally starting from square one. So monetary donations are important. What we've done for King County residents is we've set up an opportunity for them to make monetary donations that will go directly to the residents of, uh, of Fairdale. Um, I put a flyer at each of your positions today explaining a little more about the donation process. Um, also giving you the link to the site where you can donate via credit card. We're also able to accept checks, money orders, cash in the treasurer's office. So it's important to help our neighbors. It's important to be ready when something like, like this takes place. And I'd like to leave you with one final thought. It's not important who you're volunteering for, but it is important that you volunteer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Don. Uh, again, you know, good people's charity and generosity actually swamps some circumstances. So uh, our energy needs to be channeled into effective uh, contributions. So this is really a call uh, to recruitment, a call to volunteering, but volunteering in a constructive way, a coordinated way. Uh, two, two ways. Uh, first, uh, Don Bryant and our emergency management operation has 65 uh, core volunteers. That's a huge uh, army. Uh, they meet once a week. Uh, there was a, a, a like a uh, recognition dinner uh, several months ago, and I was amazed. Folks actually take, I think it was a Tuesday night each week, and they come in uh, to get to know each other better, to train, and that's the core of the rapid response uh, unit. Then uh, the second thing that I, I was not familiar with until uh, in the last couple of days is that uh, VOAD, uh, the opportunity for quickly expandable capacity, and where some of us wouldn't volunteer to go someplace once a week, although it's a really admirable thing, it does give us another opportunity. Uh, uh, outlet. So, any anything, any further questions that you might have at another time, if you ask Don, he's at at uh, our service. So, thank you, Don. Okay, I believe that we don't have any speakers on any of the agenda uh, items. Uh, so, next on the agenda is zoning petitions. I'd like to ask Development Committee Chairman Kirk Kozark to discuss and make a motion to amend the zoning petition. Thank you and good morning. Uh, the only petition we have today is 4341 in Caneland Township. This is rezoning of an F to an F1. Basically, it's cutting off the um, residential home, home stand from the rest of the farming district. There were none, uh, there were no objectors. Uh, staff, zoning, and development committee all approved, and I'll make the motion. Okay, so moved by Mr. Kozarek, seconded by uh, Mr. Leonard. Um, are there any, let's see, are there any questions? If not, uh, I'd like to ask uh, the clerk to call the roll. Allen. Aye. Auger. Yes. Barrio. Yes. Castro. Yes. Davis. Yes. Ford. Yes. Fraz. Yes. Gillum. Yes. Heyman. Yes. Oshay. Yes. Ismail. Yes. Kenyon. Yes. Kazarik. Yes. Leonard. Yes. Lewis. Yes. Martin. Yes. Molina. Yes. Pollock. Yes. Sheffro. Yes. Silva. Yes. Smith. Yes. Vasquez. Yes. Wonicki. Yes. Okay, the motion passes. Okay, now on to uh, resolutions and ordinances. Uh, would anyone like to remove an, uh, any of the items from the consent agenda? 
Uh, Ms. Castro? 15-104. Okay, 15-104. Any others? Uh, Ms. Uh, Dr. Silva? 15-99, please. 1599. Uh, so. Okay, any others? Okay. If not, I'd like to have a, a motion. A motion and a second to approve the consent agenda with the exceptions of 1599 and 1504. Uh, so moved by Ms. Allen, second by Mr. Kozarek. Uh, I would like to ask the, the county clerk to please call the roll. Allen. Auger? Yes. Barrio? Yes. Castro? Yes. Davis? Yes. Ford? Yes. Fries? Yes. Gillum? Yes. Heyman? Yes. Holshade? Yes. Ismail? Yes. Kenyon? Yes. Kazarik? Yes. Leonard? Yes. Lewis? Yes. Martin? Yes. Molina? Pollock? Yes. Sheffro? Yes. Silva? Yes. Smith? Yes. Vasquez? Yes. Winnicki? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Silva, uh, would you like to make a motion for 1599? Yes. And would you like to describe it? Yes. Um, in I'd, I'd like to make a motion authorizing um, an agreement uh, between 20, for a 2015 grant chronic disease and health school health program, please. And basically, I would like to uh, bring it to your attention and to thank you ahead of time um, in, con in consideration of your support. Um, this is a $90,000 grant uh, that we can reapply for. Um, it is just another one of the reasons why it's so important to receive national accreditation. Um, it is a large amount of money. We will be pairing with a school in Carpentersville to uh, document and help fight uh, oh, childhood obesity, um, illiteracy, we've got um, heart disease, diabetes, and so this is a, a, a grant for prevention. Um, again, we'll be able to apply for this. It's likely that we will get it again. It's hopefully the grant that's going to keep on giving. We already have $100,000, and again, um, it sounds like we'll be eligible to receive it again. Thank, Thank you, Dr. You. Silva. Uh, Dr. Silva moves it. Uh, Mr. Pollack seconds it. Uh, any further discussion? Uh, Ms. Gillum? Can you tell me what uh, school it is in Carpentersville? I'm sorry, could you speak up? I couldn't hear. I, I was just questioning which school it is in Carpentersville uh -huh. that will be. Thank you. I was not given the specific name of the school, but I can find that out for you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, any other comments, questions? Uh, if not, I'd like to ask the clerk to call the roll. Allen? Yes. Auger? Yes. Barrio? Yes. Castro? Yes. Davis? Yes. Ford? Yes. Fraz? Yes. Gillum? Yes. Heyman? Yes. Hoshite? Yes. Ismail? Yes. Kenyon? Yes. Kazarik? Yes. Leonard? Yes. Lewis? Yes. Martin? Yes. Molina? Pollock? Yes. Sheflo? Yes. Silva? Yes. Smith? Yes. Vasquez? Yes. Winnecki? Yes. Okay, the motion passes. Uh, uh, Ms. Castro, would you like to uh, make a motion for number 15104? I would like to, yes. So, so moved by Ms. Castro, second by uh, Ms. Allen. Uh, would you like to describe it, please? I would. Um, actually, this week is National Public Safety <coughs> and Communic Communic Telecommunicators Week, and Mr. Sauer has dropped off some emergency chocolates and obviously left you a pin, so I hopefully you all wear that today and enjoy your emergency chocolate when you need it. But in honor of that, I would like to read the proclamation. Um, proclaiming April 12th through 18th, 2015 National Public Safety Telecommuters Week. Whereas over one half million dedicated men and women are engaged in the operation of emergency response system for federal, state, and local government entities throughout the United States. And whereas the Kane County Emergency Communications Center that receives these calls has emerged as the first point of contact for persons seeking immediate emergency assistance and is expected to multitask under emergency conditions with compassion, accuracy, and professionalism throughout the year. And whereas this week, celebrated annually, honors the thousands of men and women who respond to emergency calls, dispatch emergency professionals, 
and equipment and render life-saving assistance to the citizens, residents, and visitors of Kane County. And whereas County Board Chairman Christopher Lawson is authorized and requested to issue a proclamation calling on the people of the, of the Kane County to observe this week with appropriate ceremonies and activities. And now, therefore, it be re it resolved by the Kane County Board that the chairman thereof may and hereby will declare the week beginning April 12, 2015 through April 18, 2015, National Public Safety Telecommunicator Week and congratulate the dedicated and hardworking members of the Kane County Emergency Communications Center for their ongoing outstanding service rendered to the community. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Castro. Uh, would you like to present, uh, is that in a uh, form that it would be presented to Mr. Sauer? I don't believe or is it, it is. Not, but we not yet? Get one. Okay, so at a later uh, point we'll do that. But um, uh, <clears throat> any other thoughts or comments? Uh, if not, uh, we have a motion and a second to support. Uh, to support that uh, resolution, I'd like to ask the clerk to call the roll. Allen. Aye. Auger. Vario. <coughs> Castro. Yes. Davis. Yes. Ford. Yes. Fraz. Yes. Gillum. Yes. Heyman. Yes. Bullshay. Yes. Ismail. Yes. Kenyon. Yes. Kazarik. Yes. Leonard. Yes. Lewis. Yes. Martin. Yes. Molina. Yes. Pollock. Yes. Sheffro. Yes. Silva. Yes. Vasquez. Yes. Winecki. Yes. Okay, the motion passes. Did it miss me? You didn't, yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry. That's okay. <laughs> uh, just, Mr. Smith. Just yeah. add another yes on that. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Smith is a yes. Good. Thank you. Yes. Okay, uh, may I have, uh, let's see. Uh, next on the agenda, uh, off consent agenda resolutions. Um, we have uh, ordinance 15-119. Uh, may I have a motion and a second to place it on the floor for discussion purposes? So moved by Ms. Allen, second by uh, Mr. Leonard. Uh, I, I believe that Debbie Diaz uh, with the Dahl House will, uh, will make a presentation this morning. Uh, so Ms. Diaz, if you'd come forward and... And this is... Uh, Ordinance number 15119, amending Appendix C of the Kane County Code uh, liquor licenses. <clears throat> morning, Ms. Diaz. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Your Honorable Chairman. Before we get started, can you give me roughly about uh, how much time it'll take to give a thorough presentation for the consideration I'm of the board? less than... 15 minutes, 10 minutes. Okay, all right, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. The floor is yours. Okay, um, my name is Deborah Diaz and I'm here today seeking a liquor license for what is currently known as Blackjacks in Elgin, unincorporated Cook County. Um, with me today is Mr. Michael J. Peters. Michael is well known in our industry for upscaling gentlemen's clubs. He is actually the man who upscaled gentlemen's clubs. Most areas, um, have gentlemen's clubs. Some of them are not so nice and some of them are very elegant and that's what Michael has created for our industry. Um, I'm just going to give you a little brief synopsis. And then also with us is Jason Heider. Jason is our CPA and accountant and James Layden will be the first man in charge of the club. He's going to be our general manager. So let me start by saying uh, gentlemen's clubs are legal businesses. They're um, in every state, village, municipality across our country. Um, I know it's, it may not be socially acceptable to some people, but it is a legal business. Um, the liquor license, with, if I don't get the liquor license, we're not gonna take over Blackjacks. Blackjacks is considered like a hole in the wall compared to what we do, how we upscale our clubs. So, you know, the question here today is, does King County want that type of club, or does do you want a upscale club? And, you know, I'm going to go over the points that I said, you know, that I talked to the Liquor Control Commission, but at this time I'd like to, Michael to uh, give his presentation. Mr. Peters, I'll switch places with you. 
Yes, uh, I'm sure none of you know me, but uh, my name is Michael Peter. I'm 68 years old. Um, I'm a 1973 graduate of the Cornell University renowned School of Hotel and Restaurant Administration, <clears throat> where my father was a trustee and, and a professor and trustee emeritus. My field of expertise and my master's thesis was on private country club management, which is where I pursued my career. While running country clubs, I came in contact with a number of facilities in uh, my original working career town of Orlando, Florida, that were very similar to what you have here, blackjacks, what we consider a, a D-class cabaret of the 1950s and 60s sort. Uh, it was at that time that I created a business model and launched a national chain uh, that became three chains that are now uh, in excess of 130 operations in every major city in the United States and in eight other countries, including uh, Moscow, Russia, Paris, France, Acapulco, Mexico, Lima, Peru, Athens, Greece, etc. <clears throat> It was the birth of what we know today as the Upscale Gentlemen's Club that started in the mid-70s and probably came to most people's attention in the late 90s when we started opening the Manhattans and uh, areas of uh, large populations. <clears throat> we now operate and federally trademark uh, and, and trademark our federal licenses to uh, operators from coast to coast and around the country, as I mentioned, and I've known Debbie for quite some time, and she approached me about an opportunity uh, here in Chicago and, the, uh, and her interest in uh, securing a national trademark. We, we have very extreme standards uh, in our, for our trademark operations. We, we do what I like to call the Ritz-Carlton of hotels, uh, and one of the requirements in our trademarks, uh, um, licenses, licensees, is that they, in maintaining those standards, that they serve the finest foods and uh, spirits. So it requires that you have liquor or I don't license. <clears throat> um, we have three national chains and international chains. The Dow Houses of America is the umbrella. It also includes the Pure Platinums and the Solid Golds worldwide. <clears throat> the, uh, this, of course, then uh, would be subject, contingent upon your, uh, uh, as a board, issuing additional liquor licenses, which I understand is under consideration. Um, at the present time, with the present facility you have, which I don't want to demean, but we'll leave it at that, uh, you're running what is known, they're running what is known as a juice bar. It has almost no overhead. It generates revenues of a million dollars a year on probably 50% profit, so it's a very profitable situation for the owners who can run it with their eyes closed. They're also generating for the county approximately $30 a year in taxes, as opposed to what we're proposing, which is a complete upfit and uh, high-level operation with liquor uh, that would produce, according to our projections, well in excess of $100,000 a year to the county. And uh, it's with that respect and thought that I would highly recommend that you gentlemen and ladies consider uh, expanding from the old and coming into the modern cosmopolitan uh, circumstances of life in our country. Thank you very much. I'd like to add that Michael, that I know of, has opened over 100 clubs, probably like 135 clubs in his time. Um, I currently have a liquor license and um, am eligible for a liquor license in Harvey, Illinois, and I also have a liquor license. Um, I didn't pull it yet, but it's in a, an agreement for Bedford Park. So, 
and I also managed two other liquor licenses in Indiana. Well, I help manage because I don't really work there as much as I do the other clubs. Um, I do want to say that Blackjacks has been in business this year for 19 years. They don't plan on going away. Um, we just plan on taking it over and upscaling it. Um, I also want to add that all of our staff is going to be Bassett trained. All the wait staff and bartenders have to take tests. Um, the, we're going to up the security by double. Like if they right now, I believe they currently have what is it, 18 cameras, 16, 16 cameras. We're going to have 32 cameras. They currently have about two to three, sometimes four security. We'll be having. It just depends on the day of the week how many security you're going to have. We'll be doubling that as well. The financial benefits in an upscale gentlemen's club are huge. Um, I would like to read you some facts about adult clubs because I'm sure most of you don't know it. The adult nightclub industry, there are more than 3,000 nightclubs in the United States. This is from 2012. There are more than 90% of those clubs serve beer, wine, champagne, and liquor. All of the clubs serve bottled water, soft drinks, and energy, energy drinks. More than one million customers a day visit adult clubs every year. There are more than 350,000 entertainers and club employees working daily. There are more than 30 club chain operators controlling over 300 adult clubs. There are two publicly traded adult clubs. Adult nightclubs have combined avenue revenue of over $7.5 billion. It's multi-billion in the US alone. Adult nightclubs sell higher percentage of high-end liquor and champagne than any other club. And adult nightclubs reach a consumer demographic used to paying top dollar for entertainment. Adult nightclub industry has a national association with statewide chapters, and the adult nightclubs generate the highest revenue in liquor sales more than any other nightclub, bar, sports bar, restaurant, or lounge. I just would like to go over with you um, what I spoke with the uh, Liquor Commission about during my proposal for the liquor license. Um, some of the things I've mentioned already. So I also want to say that I have no violations on my liquor license. I did call the state of Illinois to confirm that. Um, to have Michael J. Peters uh, licensing, he's, Michael is an award-winning person. His, his trademarks all have won multiple awards. It's going to draw a more upscale clientele. And currently, I would like to add that Blackjacks is full nude. They can hire 18-year-olds. With liquor, it would be topless with 21-year-olds as entertainers. Blackjacks also currently creates many job opportunities, but we will be doubling that as well. We will have approximately 200 jobs. Our goal and our, we're known for our best in safety and security. Gentlemen's clubs have lower incidents than any other type of nightclub or restaurant lounge than, because we operate the clubs like theaters, so people aren't bumping into each other, so incidents of problems and fights is very rare. Um, I'd like to turn any questions that you may have, uh, you, I'm sure you have in the packet, are um, the financial benefits over to Jason, and thank you very much, appreciate it. Hello, good morning, everybody. Just to highlight some of the salient points that uh, Debbie had covered, in particular regarding the uh, amount of uh, collections that would be received, uh, comparatively speaking, relative to where we're at now. Uh, as Michael had highlighted, the, uh, the collections are de minimis at best, $30 a year, which is certainly rounding by any stretch. Uh, as we look even at a, a half-year projection uh, for the, uh, the county, uh, we would look to see uh, revenues of roughly $35,000 and a half year, which is a mix of uh, sales tax and uh, liquor license, uh, as well as the gaming component um, that would come into play. As we march forward into a full year, as well as into 2016, 2017, it's where we uh, exceed 50 to 60 thousand dollars in revenue just from a uh, from a county standpoint, and certainly from an overall state standpoint, uh, upwards of a quarter million dollars. So I believe at this time, if anybody has any questions, we'd be glad to answer them. Okay. All right, Ms. Diaz, uh, so 
uh, that's your, your presentation, and now we'll go into a question and answer. Yes. And then uh, once we have the answers uh, to the questions, then we'll go on to our discussion. Okay, so any clarifying questions for the presentation, and then we'll have a, our, uh, we'll go into discussion. So, uh, Ms. Silva? Yes, Dr. Good Silva, excuse me. Um, I salute your entrepreneurial spirit, um, and you. I don't doubt one bit that uh, we will have a great financial gain. You did touch a little bit on um, increasing security. Uh, I understand yes. this is, like you said at the beginning, maybe not a socially acceptable issue, and that doesn't, that's not something that I really care about. What I care about is your um, employees, the women. Um, I hear about all the things that you will do to cater to the to the um, clients, to your um, to the people who will visit your establishment. What will you be doing to help your um, employees, to the ladies that will be doing this? There is a four to five. Um, there is four to five times uh, a higher incident rate of suicide and other problems, mental health issues, and people in the sex industry compared to the rest of the country. Um, have you given at all any thought as to how you would um, support the girls, the ladies? That um, statistic that you just mentioned, I don't believe in it. I don't believe it at all. I believe that most of the entertainers that come to work for us come at a downtime in their life. Not everybody's blessed like all of us. Um, most of the girls are single mothers who nobody helps them. Their own parents can't help them. So to feed their children, this is what they, they do. It's a, I also have seen girls who come to us that don't even know how to read and have gone on to win Emmys and become doctors and nurses, you know, and established people. I have not seen one girl leave in a, better, in a bad place. They all leave in a better place. So what will you do specifically, or what, what will this enhancement into a gentleman's club do to provide more support, or um, how will this benefit the, the people who are already working there, specifically the women? I believe it benefits the women First and foremost, financially, you know, when you can get, get money, then they can put themselves through school, you know, provide for their families. And that's why I've never seen, I've been in this business for 30 years, and I've never seen one person leave in a bad place. I mean, there are people who have accidents, I've seen that, but I have not seen any incidents of suicide ever. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Silva. Other questions, clarifying questions before we go into the board discussion? Ms. Allen, then Mr. Smith. Um, I sit on the Liquor Commission, yes. and so I had the advantage of hearing your presentation before. But I remembered a list of, of the contributions to the county, not just revenue, but job creation. And there were some other right. things that you mentioned. Do you remember some of yes. those? Yes, um, well, the job creation is we're going to create 200 jobs. And one of the things I did mention is we do charitable things all the time. We um, do charity golf outings where every dollar, every cent goes to whatever charity that we're going to sponsor. We've supported kids going back to school. We work with park districts and give, you know, sports equipment for the summer, things like that. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Allen. <clears throat> Mr. Smith? We dealt with the same issue, I believe, about two years ago. Yes, I was here two years what, ago. What has changed in your presentation to make you think that this board will vote any differently than we did at that time? I think several things have changed. I think even today, um, if you are wanting to create more liquor licenses with the legalized gaming, um, you know, I think that has changed. I think um, teaching and, you know, even all of you, I don't think you really knew. I don't know if any of you have ever been in a gentleman's club. It's a upscale, well, my businesses that I run are all upscale. And I think the revenue is huge. The, 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 choice, the revenue, whether you want to get the $30 or the $60,000, $70,000 or 100000 Okay. Other questions? Right. Clarifying. Mr. Shefflow? Are you proposing to increase the size of the building and the parking, and um, or are you going to work, or are you going to commit to stay in the size of that footprint? We're going to stay in the size of the footprint, and we're going to upscale it, clean the 
parking lot, perhaps put on a new facade, um, new signage, and it would, the footprint would stay the same. We're not tr asking for a bigger. Okay, along the lines of uh, Miss Allen's question, I believe that during the Liquor Commission, uh, the, the uh, comment was made that a $250,000 investment into the property. Yes. Although I, I realize that we're not talking about development of property, we're talking just about the liquor license part of it, but uh, that's a connected question from the earlier meeting. Other questions to clarify? Uh, Mr. Pollack? The financials that we received, this CDH Food and Beverage Inc. financial projections, did you guys provide those to us? Is, is, that, is this from the... Yes, we, I provided it. Okay. Um, you mentioned doubling security and some of the other things. Security is, yes. a, is a concern to me. I'm looking at the budget, excuse me, I'm looking at the budget and your projections would be going forward 2016, 2017. I know 2015, obviously you don't own it yet, so we can't hold you for that. But looking at 2016 and 27, the line item for security, $1,172 and in 17, 1000 $198 in terms of just the money itself, that's not, that doesn't increase a doubling of security to me. And I guess I'm not sure how you secure the property for eleven. I can I can answer that question. Our security is in a tip pool. Um, they actually make minimum of $20 an hour, but they barely, they make minimum wage plus tips. So that's why the number's low. I think another salient point on here is the security that you see highlighted on here is the actual monitoring equipment. That is not the actual bodies. So that would be presented in the salary and wages uh, line. So that would be the actual human component of the security. I understand that part of it, but even if you're making a larger investment into cameras, I'm only seeing $1,000, so I just I wasn't sure how that shows the, the investment in the security. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Pollack. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. Oh, okay. and now did, did, I wanna make sure that we've uh, set aside enough time so that you could make a complete presentation and answer all the questions that came from the board. Do you feel satisfied that uh, that's occurred? Let me see. I'll just look over my notes really quick. Okay, and if you'd like to make any closing comment, that'd be a summary comment, that'd be fine. I'd like to, yeah, I would like to close by saying, um, Two things, like the one thing is the fact that I said adult nightclubs generate more revenue than any other type of club. This is a well-known fact, and that's why you know we're projecting to make up towards $100,000 a week. And the sale of the the liquor is usually upcharged. You know, we don't every so it's the revenue is going to be much higher. And you know, like sports bars, nightclubs, you have higher incidence of fights, problems, things like that. Most people who come to a gentleman's club are not coming there to get, they're not kids, they're men, they're women. They're, um, they're, the demographic is much older than a nightclub or a sports bar. Okay, is there anything else that you wanna add? Anything you just wanna add, James? Come on. Um, if they add to that, uh, uh, currently uh, blackjacks can uh, be open 24 hours, no liquor license, and it's uh, it's serving 18 and uh, older kids, and and we do get 18 uh, and older kids. Would you use the mic? I'm sorry, I, I'm so, old. Okay. I need to, the mic. <laughs> currently, um, uh, blackjacks can be open 24 hours, which it has been open till three, four, five o'clock in the morning. Uh, because the business is there and no liquor license um, with 18, 19, 20 year old kids in there. Um, and without the liquor, or with the liquor license, the, uh, the hours of operation would be uh, regulated to one o'clock during the, during the week and two o'clock on the weekends. So. And 21 years old, of course. Did you okay. want to say something, Michael? Just one. All right, I think we've um, put our presentation in. I really want to thank everybody for your time and consideration today. Question. Thank you. Okay, um, Ms. Diaz, um, before we wrap up, we have a, an, another question from Mr. Hoshite. 
Mr. Hoshay. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, just in light of the, the final comments that were made, I do have a couple questions. And I, we, we did, uh, I did ask this question last time. This facility did have a liquor license up until a few years ago when that liquor license lapsed. And the reason it lapsed do you, was that the prior owners uh, were shut down? Is that? Well, no, the prior owners are still existing owners. They just are convicted felons. Right. So that's another point. If you want to have convicted felons running a business in your county. And I asked this question last time, and do you have any relationship to the prior owner? Well, I belong to ACE, and that's where I met Mr. Tony Butita. Um, ACE is an association of club executives, and we have statewide chapters, and I was on the national board and the state chapter, and so I've done some work with Tony Butita. No family relationship? No, none one. whatsoever. I'm Mexican and Norwegian and German. I think he's Ital Italian. Okay, Mr. Thank Hoshay, you. anything else? Okay, uh, I want to be sure that we've set aside uh, whatever time you need to make a, a thorough presentation. Are you satisfied that you've had that opportunity? Yes. Okay, thank you so much for thank coming. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank, thank you, you. Uh, fellas, for joining and, and participating. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, now I'd like to turn it over to the board for your consideration. Um, any comments, Mr. O? Oh. Do we have a no? We have a motion in a second. So, but thanks for being thorough, uh, Mr. Hoshite. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll, I'll try to be brief. I, first of all, um, you know, we considered this two years ago. Uh, my position hasn't changed since two years ago. Uh, we had the same debate at that time. Uh, there is no questioning the legality of the use of the facility for its current uh, operation. And, uh, you know, I have no criticism or regarding the credentials of the people that presented this morning. They're clearly credible in their industry. Um, but the question for us is really one of uh, discretion here. And uh, I've received a lot of calls from constituents back two years ago. Uh, the same calls and concerns uh, I've received now. Their position hasn't changed. The decision is whether we grant the liquor license to this facility to allow an expansion of what's going on in the current facility. And I, I would say as a matter of discretion, if we're looking for economic development, and that was our only goal as a board, we would talk about proliferation of licenses for gentlemen clubs in everyone's district because, you know, there could be a demand for that use there. And my, uh, I would suspect, however, if we brought that forward to development committee or to the liquor commission, uh, that wouldn't be met with favorable results. And so I think we need to take that into account. One, one comment I would make uh, for those of you who would be inclined to vote for this because of the economic uh, uh, information presented, a significant portion of the increased revenue is from additional gaming. And we know that there is an unli unlimited gaming revenue. Uh, certainly if the facility was granted a license and, and uh, incorporated gaming into their operation, there would be gaming revenue. But we know uh, from the statistics we received from Grand Victoria the impact that local gaming and other facilities has had on their revenue. And so I would suggest that that's more of a spreading around of the gaming dollars than creating a new source of revenue. And I think that's what the history has shown uh, with the gaming revenue in the other facilities. So. Um, just for the same reasons we talked about two years ago. The other concern that was raised before is that the operation as it currently exists is not a class A operation uh, and, uh, and, and there, it causes some threat to public health and that therefore if we allowed the facility to be upgraded uh, that that would somehow improve the situation. I think the trade-off there is this, that in the last two years I have not received any calls or complaints regarding the operation that's gone on there uh, from constituents or parents of, uh, you know, 18-year-olds who have frequented the facility. And those are the calls that we would get typically if there was a concern. And I think you have to trade that off uh, to uh, allowing what's there to exist now versus increasing by six times by the revenue projections uh, what would go on if we allowed uh, the liquor license to exist. So it's for all those reasons that I would vote no on this uh, motion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Hoshe. Other comments, questions? <clears throat> uh, Mr. Heyman. I was looking at it in, uh, I have a problem with 18 year olds going in there and then they have totally nude with the 18 year olds as high school kids. 
and the hours of operation, they can be in 24 hours, and I know it was the hope of a few that this would just go away, and it's been two years, and we collected, what, about 60 bucks for two years? <clears throat> so, I was in favor of the 21 and up, and plus we would get the revenue out of there. I don't know, that, that's all. Okay, thank you, Mr. Heyman. Ms. Allen? I don't think this is an argument over, over revenue. Um, I think we're here doing policy. And I guess if you have a business that's legitimate under state law, then my interest would be in uh, with deference to Mr. Hoshite and his district, my interest would be in regulating that business, in having accepted rules, having to do with security, having to do with age, having to do with the fact that food would be served as well as beverage. Um, I would want to have hours and, and limitations and regulations so that a, a prohibition didn't work, but regulating it works. Uh, the drug war hasn't worked, but if drugs were sold in Walgreens, our lives might be a lot more manageable. I just, um, if you have a legitimate business, I think the deal is to try and write rules that are sensible and, and then insist that they be followed. I was also concerned because if Elgin were to have this business, we would try and put it in probably an industrial park. We would zone it into an area where the least concern to a residential area would would arise. And in a way, this is sort of an industrial park location. It has waste management across the street and um, uh, o turf. open space force <laughs> preserve around it. But at least it, it limits it limits the um, um, access to a, a residential location or schools or churches or uh, community events. So in a way it's a kind of zoning and a zoning location. Um, that's, that's, those are my comments. Thank you, Ms. Allen. Mr. Kenyon, and then Mr. Lewis. As it is, I'm the one who lives the closest to it. <laughs> <laughs> I could walk there if I so wished or ride my motorcycle. But I, I really would like to support John Hoshot. However, I think what we're trying to decide is do we want this business to be run better? Do we want it professionally run? And do we want to have only a, well, adult like people there? At the 18 year old, I can agree with that. They don't need to be there. And I, I'm thinking when I hear that these people will run this place as professionally and it'll be run better than it's run now. And it's no, so it's not all about money. It's, it's being well run. So if I still vote yes, it'll be because I'm voting for a well run organization that would provide the services they do to the young people. Thank you, Mr. Kenyon. Mr. Lewis? I think uh, there have been a number of good comments. Uh, I intend to support uh, John Hoshite on this, um, but for, for a different reason. Um, we set policy on the county board that encourages certain behaviors. And um, when I look at blackjacks and or, um, you know, organizations that are uh, primarily uh, serving alcohol, and I view them in a remote location as this is. This is not a location that you can walk to. This is a location you drive to. And um, we have a lot of initiatives here in this county uh, that address uh, alcohol-related uh, driving and its impact on our citizens here in Kane County. And um, so I view this vote, I view an affirmative vote on this equivalent to um, a board member supporting the concept of a destination, and I quote, that has the highest liquor revenue of any organization that you can establish uh, in a remote location. And the only way you can get to and from it is in an automobile. Uh, so I will be voting no, and uh, that's the reason I'm voting no. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. Uh, Mr. Fraz, did you have your hand up? Yeah. Um, 
you know, we're voting today on a liquor license. A liquor license is one of the prerequisites to get a gaming license. As John pointed out, we have a <coughs> riverboat a few miles down the road from this location, which is going to be diminished by having a gaming operation right in the same community. Um, I'm going to vote no on this to support our riverboat fund, and I've, I'm a long-time <coughs> opponent of expanded gambling. Thank you. Okay. Other, uh, Mr. Smith? I emphasize with John Hoshite. I know the constituents in my district, and I, I can imagine what if this location was in my district, the amount of people that would be calling me complaining about it. That's something John has to put up with. If we allow liquor to go in there, those complaints will be uh, tenfold as what they are now. So uh, well, I'm going to vote with uh, John. Complaints. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Uh, Mr. Kozarek and then Ms. Wonicki. Um, yeah, I guess I have a couple points. Um, I'm, I'm actually going to vote in favor of this for the economic reasons. Um, and I just uh, kind of address some of the issues that were brought up by some of my esteemed colleagues who I, I respect. Um, I, I do not think people go to a strip club to gamble. I do not think people go to a strip club to drink. So I don't think that's the primary reason that anyone's going to go to that. Um, most of us here know why people go to strip clubs, and I, and I don't think that's the reason. So I, I wouldn't vote against it for that reason. Um, I think changing $30, $30 into $100,000 would be great. Um, I think most of us here are looking for that same amount. TR, you mentioned that um, John would get 10 times the amount of um, complaints. And I think John said that he hasn't gotten any complaints in the last two years. So 10 times zero. Wait till they serve liquor. Is zero. But I, I, you know, just to kind of address that point. So I mean, we're still looking at zero complaints times 10. That's zero. So we'll kind of see on that. But I, I'm going to vote in favor of this one. Um, and I'm, I might be in the minority on this, but that's my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kozar. Ms. Wonicki. Uh, thank you, Chairman Lawson. Uh, I just, what is the term? of the liquor license if they were if we were to issue a liquor license when do they come in for renewal do we do we know the answer to that? one year according to miss garza okay each so year they year come back they come for monitoring for thank you but point of clarification though all right mr hoshite we don't have a history of revoking a lot once you grant a license it's right. automatic renewal essentially okay yes, okay uh let's see uh, I guess on the same issue, but let's, okay, Ms. Allen? Hey, um, I am new on the Liquor Commission this year, and what I understand is that we approve every license every year. That's what we did in that meeting, I believe, so. Yes. A, a year or two. And we consider each one. It's, it's true, uh, and, and the, it's also true, uh, both points are true, that we uh, evaluate each one that uh, there um, there are very few if any cases where the <clears throat> liquor license is not renewed you know historically I think that both of those points are valid uh, Miss Molina Thank you, Chairman. I just want to leave um, uh, my fellow board members with a thought. Um, I, I, I sit on the Lurker Commission, and I, um, I, I support this. Um, I, I drive by a different uh, establishment every day going to work in Albany Park called Al, uh, the, Al, um, the Admiral Theater. Um, and listed on top of the Admiral Theater is a, a quote, and I'll read it to you. It says, the greatest right that any nation can afford its citizens is the right to be left alone. So um, I want to hold you with that and think um, not so much, we're not making a moral decision here, we're making a decision based on the liquor license and what it can do to provide our citizens um, the opportunity of jobs, 250 jobs, uh, security, um, and uh, sometimes we just need to let our citizens be. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Molina. Mr. Martin. Yep. At the risk of being simplistic, I guess I look at the rest of the board members and say, and, and it's partly repetitive here, what would you do if this was in your district? And what would you do if this petition was in your district? Uh, it's easy. You know, it's buried in the forest preserve. It's across the street from a farmer. Uh, <laughs> 
Well, I'm just saying, you know, we are we are elected, and we have we have to. It's a Republican form of government. We have to make decisions. We're not slaves to the electorate's immediate concerns. But the fact of the matter is, our constituents, I think, in my district, would not want this, and I will support John from the same standpoint. And I guess the question I have is, if it's in your district, uh, are we going to support it? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Uh, Mr. Shefflow? Thank you. Uh, I'm going to vote against it for the same reasons I did uh, a couple years ago, and it's social issues and other issues. But the thing I wanted to mention was uh, I also don't believe it's a, a, a good land use in that area. Um, the, the, for the county in particular. Uh, if this was a Dave & Buster's or some other intense use, um, it's not a good location for that use. I would direct uh, the applicants to uh, find a municipality that has a location, um, and acquire that property, go through their zoning ordinance, deal with their police department, their fire department, um, their health department, and, and they're just better set up for that type of an intense use. And, and there are places for them, uh, very few, I think, but um, rural, isolated county properties are not good land uses for uh, in intense uses. Okay. Th thank you, Mr. Shefflow. Mr. Heyman? One other thing. It, the last time the vote went, and it was for two years ago, they didn't go away. And we're going to still have the place, even if you vote it down, and you're going to get $30.00. With the liquor license, we have some control, <clears throat> and if there's violations, there's always suspension. That's okay. Thank you, Mr. Heyman. Any final thoughts? Any other comments? If not, I would... Of course. Ms. Allen, I've, did. I've spoken too often, so... No, it's just three. But who's counting? We what? love you. <laughs> What I, what I was just favorite. going to say was I, I don't know if people in my district are going to this club. I, I, um, I have not gone to it. But one of the, one of the things that I, I do have lots of bars in my district. In fact, I have a casino in my district, I'm delighted to say. The, the thing is that I, if it were Vegas, if it were upscale as these folks are promising. Um, I, if, if this comes into John's district or any of our districts, I would just like it to be a place that I wouldn't mind my neighbors going to, that it would, it would look like a, a, place of, um, a place of adult entertainment that was classic. And this place has looked so poor for so long it looks like what we all think it is. So if it does get new management, if it does get a license, then my hope for it would that it would become a place that we could have some, uh, have some respect for, some dignity. Okay, thank you, Ms. Allen. Were there That's any other- people go to Vegas, they don't come to Kane County to live. Okay, are there other uh, comments, questions? Okay, if not, I'd like to thank all the board members, uh, our guests for uh, your respectful discussion and consideration of this. I'd like to ask the clerk to call the roll. Allen. Uh, Auger. No. Barrero. No. Castro. No. Davis. No. Ford. No. Fraz. No. Gillum. Heyman. Yes. Holshay. No. Ismail. Yes. Kenyon. I'll stay with yes. Yes. Kozari? Yes. Leonard? No. Lewis? No. Martin? No. Molina? Yes. Pollock? No. Sheffro? No. Silva? No. Smith? No. Vasquez? No. Winnicky? No. Who is this? Not even a cigar. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Okay, I believe that the uh, vote was uh, 17 no's, six yeses. Uh, the motion fails. Okay. Okay. Uh, I believe that there's, uh, we have a need for executive session today, so may I have a motion and a second to go into executive session to discuss settlement of a claim? Uh, so moved by Mr. Leonard, second by uh, Mr. Martin. All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, nay. Uh, ayes have it. And as soon as uh, we're together, we'll call a roll. Okay, uh, we're back in open session. May I have a motion and a second to approve settlement claim number 14 WC 031815 in the amount of 54,124.50. Uh, so moved by Mr. Ishmael, second by Mr. Uh, Pollock. Uh, uh, any questions, comments? If not, uh, I'd like to ask the clerk to call the roll. Alan. Aye. Yes. Mario. Yes. Castro. Yes. 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 Ford. Yes. Rod. Yes. Gillen. Yes. Hamer. Yes. Bullshit. Yes. Kenyon. Yes. yes. Zadari. Yes. Leonard. Yes. Martin. Yes. Molina. Yes. Pollock. Yes. Sheffield. <coughs> yes. Silva. <coughs> Smith. Yes. Vasquez. Yes. Nick. Yes. Okay, so the motion passes. Uh, are there any speakers on non-agenda items? If not, oh, excuse me. <laughs> uh, if not, before we have the motion to adjourn, uh, are there any comments for the good of the organization? Uh, emergency chocolate now. Miss <laughs> uh, Miss uh, Barrero. I just wanted to let everybody know about our 2015 uh, Leaders Summit at the Q Center in mm -hmm. St. Charles on uh, May 8th. It's from 8.30 to 3 if anybody's interested in attending. Um, this is, uh, let me read it to you. The 2015 King County Leaders Summit will conduct elected and appointed officials in local government, local leaders of institutions and businesses, land development leaders, with regional and state agencies, national trends in real estate development, and fiscal sustainability. This is one of the our um, objectives to, with the Jobs Committee, and um, develop our development um, department is behind the summit. So, if anybody's interested, please sign up. Again, this is on May 8th, 8:30 to 3 at the Q Center in St. Charles. Uh, thank you very much, uh, oh, Mr. Kenyon. On the same subject. Oh, no, Barbara okay. asked me to remind you one more time of the Pork Chop Dinner, which is this Saturday night at the fairgrounds for supporting the 4-H program. Good. Thank I you, Mr. Kenyon. I so she could run out here. So. Thank you, Mr. Kenyon. Uh, Ms. Barrero, thank you very much for bringing that, uh, that uh, announcement up about the Leadership Summit. Uh, actually, a lot of work has been put into this. It used to be that it was development, transportation, and the health department would get together, relatively small group, coordinate their effort, uh, win national recognition for doing it the right way. This time, they bumped it up a couple of levels, and it becomes a, a leadership summit uh, similar to what Lake County and DuPage County are doing. So if you have people who are constituents in your district who you feel have particular influence in forming, you know, the better Kane County, uh, please let us know. We'll invite them. Uh, what Mark uh, Van Kirkhoff and Barb Jeffers and Carl Shadle have done is they're bringing in the Secretary of Transportation uh, so Randy Blankenhorn, so it'll be, you know, face to face with that person. They've uh, brought in the Community Outreach Second in Command of Public Health. Uh, uh, Mark Van Kirkhoff has brought in the new director of uh, the Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity, private equity uh, fella who's uh, helped form, I think it's 145 different companies, knows about employment. He's gonna be one of the uh, guest speakers. So you, you have the connection built between state government that has, that, whether you like it or not, 
has a tremendous impact on what we do here and uh, all of our local folks. So uh, we're building the bridge between those two important constituencies. So I would ask you to put it on your calendar, and then I ask you to let us know who you would want to have invited uh, who forms influence in your districts. Okay? So with that, I'm going to recognize Mr. Heyman for a motion to adjourn, second by Mr. Kenyon. Uh, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed nay, ayes have it.